Ambassador Joram Ettinger, I'm honored to have you here on our show today. Thank you. Thank you for uh, being with us. And would you please acquaint our viewers of your experience and record in the Israeli foreign ministry? For about 10 years, I was uh, head of a Middle East uh, research unit in the Israeli civil service. And that acquainted me with the uh, unpredictabilities and the instability and in a way with the frustrating nature of the Middle East and the difference between the Middle East state of mind and Western state of mind. I was then posted to Houston, Texas, and I became the Consul General for Israel to the Southwestern states. And that was a very rewarding experience, which introduced me to small town America and the flyover America an area with abundance of appreciation of the Judeo-Christian foundations of the U.S. and uh, Israel, and also an area which is largely unknown to Israeli movers and shakers. Then I was posted to the embassy in Washington with the rank of an ambassador. I was in charge of our relations with the U.S. Congress, which acquainted me with the House of Representatives and with the Senate, but mostly with the power of the individual constituent. When you walk in the corridors of uh, Congress, you can hear what I call the battle cry of the American uh, voter. We shall remember in November. And no constituent should undermine his or her potential impact on the representatives in the House or the senators, they fear, they fear the constituents and they reflect basically the will of the constituents. Ambassador Ettinger, 2020 marks 400 years of the relationship between Israel or the Judeo, I would say, culture and religion with the American culture. And it seems to me that a lot has changed ever since. And what do you think happened that caused so many things to change along the course of the years? Well, th there's no doubt that uh, the U.S. population has gone through very, I would say, massive and dramatic demographic changes, which have caused also ideological uh, changes and cultural uh, changes throughout the U.S., mostly in the big cities, less so in small-town uh, America. But there has definitely been a departure from the early pilgrims and the founding fathers' uh, values, which formed the number one power in the world, the USA, and the current minimization of regard for those uh, values. If we go back 400 years, in fact, in November 2020, it will be exactly 400 years. Uh, Where do you start counting from? Because America that, is not 400 years old. Yeah, but uh, November was the arrival of the Mayflower. And the 102 passengers on the Mayflower to the shores of uh, New Plymouth uh, in, uh, in the USA of today. 1620. 1620. And the 102 passengers, uh, they in fact considered themselves to be the modern day chosen people. They regarded Britain as the modern day Egypt. They considered the sail through the Atlantic, uh, seven, eight week sail, uh, as the modern day parting of the sea. And the USA of today was referred to as the new Israel, new Canaan, the modern day uh, promised uh, land. Therefore, uh, we are talking here in Jerusalem. We only have one Jerusalem in Israel, in the U.S., you have 18 uh, Jerusalems. Wow. Uh, you have, in fact, 32 Salems. Salem or Shalem in Hebrew was the original name of uh, Jerusalem. 
you have uh, 18 uh, Zions, among them uh, Zion uh, National uh, Park. You have more than 80 Shilohs in the U.S., uh, over 20 or 30 Bethels in the U.S., and many other such, uh, mm -hmm. such towns. That also gave rise to the prominence of the legacy of Moses in the formation of the worldview of the early pilgrims, then the founding fathers, then the formation of the American constitution, the American political system, the American system of justice, and therefore in the U.S. Supreme Court, you have about seven uh, statues and engravements of Moses and the Ten Commandments in the House of Representatives uh, in front or across from the Speaker of the House, there is the bust of the head of uh, Moses. Now, he's not the only one. There are 23, 23 such busts around the chamber. Those are the major lawgivers in human history, but Moses is at the center. Moses stares at the Speaker of the House, and Moses' bust is the only one who looks straight. All the other 22 are in profile. When I first noticed that, I asked the curator of the Capitol building, why is this bus different than all other bus? And their response was very interesting. Aren't you a Jew from Israel? Don't you know that Moses is the foundation of human law and all the rest are the derivatives? Therefore, the foundation stares at the speaker and the derivatives are in profile. They stare at the foundation. And by the way, we have, uh, or Americans have, over 200 statues or, or monuments of the Ten Commandments throughout the USA. One of them on the ground of the Texas State Capitol in Austin, Texas. Another one on the ground of the Arkansas uh, State Capitol in Little Rock. Another one in Oklahoma City and many other such uh, sites. So obviously the uh, immigration of those newcomers into the new found uh, area territory literally brought the Judeo-Christian uh, belief uh, into a new level. It's a combination of American and Jewish culture, although they are not trying to be, the Americans are not trying to be Jewish. They are valuing the Jewish heritage. In your time as ambassador to Washington, what stood out to you the most regarding the Israeli-American relationship at the time? Well, first of all, to make clear, I was not the ambassador uh, to the U.S. I was an ambassador at the embassy in charge of congressional yes. uh, relations. Uh, when I was in Washington, it was pretty rough uh, sail for the Israeli boat in, uh, in the States. Uh, that was the time of uh, President Bush Sr. and Secretary of State uh, Jim Baker. Uh, both were not among Israel's best friends uh, in the history of U.S.-Israel relations. However, uh, the most revealing uh, reality at that time was the power of uh, Congress. While the relations between the American and Israeli administrations were very, very rocky, very unfriendly, still cooperation between the two countries expanded to an all-time high uh, degree. And that was primarily because of congressional initiatives, House and Senate uh, initiatives. And that's when I personally learned the unique feature of the American political system, which centers around the constituent and their representatives. And the power of the House members and the senators is best uh, described by the power of the purse. Uh, the administration at that time wanted to punish then Prime Minister Shamir of Israel on numerous occasions, but it was 
Capitol Hill, the House and Senate that stood by uh, Israel. And not only because the friendship towards Israel, but because of the realization that the cooperation between U.S. and Israel is a two-way street benefiting the, uh, the USA. Uh, I remember one particular clash between the administration and the legislature when the administration opposed certain amendments to the Defense Appropriations Bill, uh, amendments which expanded defense cooperation between U.S. and Israel, and the chief appropriator told the administration very bluntly, according to the Constitution, I supervise you. You do not supervise me. Legislature prevailed, and the administration had to take a step uh, back. Amazing. That's fascinating. Um, you just mentioned the fact that it's a two-way street, this whole Israel-America relationship. Now, most of our viewers are uh, what we call evangelical Christians, and many of them are from the United States. Many others are from all over the world. And for them, the benefit of standing by Israel is primarily spiritual and biblical. However, reading your articles, and at the very end of this uh, interview, I would like you to introduce your blog and your report that you uh, that you put up every few weeks. In your articles, I read something very fascinating, and that is, it's not just a spiritual blessing to America to support and help and aid Israel every year. We're talking about $3 billion, to the best of my knowledge. 3.8. 3.8, close to $4 billion a year of an annual aid to, uh, to Israel. How do you see America benefiting from it? Well, former uh, chief of Air Force Intelligence, uh, General George Keegan, uh, praised cooperation with Israel, claiming that the U.S. could not procure the value and the scope of intelligence derived from Israel as far as the capabilities of Russian-made military systems, as far as uh, counter-terrorism intelligence, as far as saving American lives, the U.S. could not procure such intelligence with less than five CIAs. The budget of the CIA, to the best of my knowledge, is about $15 billion annually. So let's assume that General George Keegan exaggerated. And Israel does not contribute the value of five CIAs. Maybe only two CIAs. Maybe only one CIA. It's already almost five times the value of what is called uh, erroneously foreign aid to Israel. Obviously, we in Israel are gr grateful for the $3.8 billion uh, in terms of American military systems. But let's be very, very clear. This is an American investment in Israel, not a handout to Israel. And the question is, does that annual investment in Israel produce any added value and to what extent? So again, according to George Keegan, this is about 450, 500% annual rate of return. I don't know of any American investment overseas which produces such uh, annual rate of return. But you can go one step further. Uh, to the U.S. today employs uh, F-15 and F-16 uh, in Afghanistan and uh, Iraq. Israel was the first one to use F-15 in combat missions. And again, Israel was and is grateful to the U.S., to be able to receive from the U.S. those F-15s. But Israel has been all along a cost-effective, battle-tested laboratory for the American defense industries, 
and American Armed Services. Today, the U.S. flies a highly, highly improved F-15 primarily because of the Israeli laboratory. For 10 years, Israel employed every single day the F-15 and the F-16s under battle conditions. The U.S., did not use that F-15 and the F-16 during those 10 years. But in the 11th year, the U.S. first time used that F-15, it was enriched by modifications complement of the Israeli laboratory. To give you a specific example, there is an Israeli team on location in uh, the Missouri plant which manufactures the F-15, and the Fort Worth, Texas plant, which manufactures the F-16 and the F-35. Every single day, the Israeli Air Force shares with the manufacturers through the Israeli team lessons learned as far as operations, as far as maintenance, as far as repairs. Those lessons are integrated as upgrades into the next generation Mm -hmm. of the plane. One of the managers of the plant in Fort Worth, Texas, told me that those upgrades worth for the manufacturers, some were around what he termed mega billion dollar bonanza. Not only is it a mega billion dollar bonanza, it saves the manufacturer anywhere between 10 and 15 years of research and development. It enhances the competitiveness of the defense industries in the global competition. Therefore, it increases American exports. It expands the employment base of the American defense industry. Now, Israel uses 100 or well above 100 American military system. Each one we employ under battle conditions, each one we improve by sharing with the manufacturer our lessons for simple reason. Israel wants next time to get a better product from the American, and it's a two-way street. Israel benefits and the U.S. benefits. Uh, The late uh, General uh, Alexander Haig, who was Supreme Commander of NATO and later on the U.S. Secretary of State, was one of the more enthusiastic supporters of enhanced cooperation between the U.S. and Israel. And when he was asked, how come you're so hot about Israel? His response was, because Israel is the largest American aircraft carrier, which does not require a single American on board, which is deployed in a most critical region for U.S. interests between Europe and Asia and Africa, between the Mediterranean, the Red Sea, and the Indian Ocean. And if there were not Israel in the Middle East, then the U.S. would have to deploy few more real aircraft carriers to this region, few more ground divisions to this region, all of which would have cost the American taxpayer anywhere between 15 and $20 billion annually. That's all is spared by one Jewish state in the Western uh, Middle East. And I have litany of other examples. Just to give you uh, one such uh, example, I visited uh, Birmingham, Alabama. And uh, my first uh, meeting was with a president of uh, one of the campuses in the, in the Birmingham area, who happened to be a former commandant of the U.S. Uh, Marine uh, Corps. And we spoke about Iran and Iraq and U.S.-Israel relations. And then I asked him if he had any direct contact with the uh, Israeli Defense Forces. And he said, absolutely, he said. He fought in the first Gulf War, and the way he told me, the way he fought Soviet tanks operated by Saddam was to study the way Israel fought Soviet tanks operated by the Egyptians in the Sinai Peninsula. And then he added that he was one of the guys devising battle tactics for the U.S. armed forces, and that's done mostly in Fort Leavenworth, uh, Kansas. 
the uh, intellectual mecca, so to speak, of the armed U.S. armed forces. And then he asked me rhetorically, how do you think, Yoram, we formulate battle tactics in Fort Leavenworth, Kansas, if not in accordance with the Israeli battle uh, experience? Mm. Wow, what a fascinating topic. It seems like uh, even with the F-35, there's another um, wave of improvement based and, on the Israeli. And much more beneficial to the U.S. because the F-35 is much more expensive and much more sophisticated. And again, Israel is the first country to employ the F-35 under battle conditions, mm -hmm. which leads me, if, with your permission, yes. to another Please. example. I gave a talk uh, to uh, Dallas crowd, by the way, it was a Christian conference in uh, Dallas. And at the end, people came over with their feedback, and one of them introduced himself, a retired uh, combat pilot from the U.S. Air Force. And he said, I would like to add one more example to your inventory. And he said that being a retired combat pilot, he knows that the most productive time for American combat pilot is joint exercises with the Israeli Air Force. My response was that I'm very uh, gratified to hear that, but it's very difficult me, for me to accept it because after all, Israel is employing American hardware. The IQ of Israeli pilots is not higher than the IQ of American pilots. So why would American pilots benefit mostly when they practice together with Israeli pilots? His response was because Israeli pilots fly always under do or die state of mind, whether it's training or operation. Once you take off in Israel due to the narrow waistline, you are already within enemy's radar range and enemy's missiles range. American pilots rarely, if at all, experience do or die state of mind. When you fly under do or die state of mind, told me the American pilot, you perform much more creatively, mm. much more audaciously, and you stretch the capabilities of the American plane to a range which Americans don't realize. And he told me, the only way for us American pilots to realize how excellent is the F-35 or the F-16 or the F-15 is to watch the Israelis maneuvering our plane. That's the reason it's so beneficial for the American Air Force to conduct joint exercises with the Israeli Air Force. And by the way, during the height of the COVID-19, uh, it was the end of uh, March when the U.S. canceled almost all joint exercises with foreign militaries, one of the very, very few exercises which was not canceled was a joint F-35 exercise maneuver between American and Israeli F-35 uh, planes. And the aim was, again, for the Americans to realize how really good is the F-35. Ambassador Ettinger, I'm going to ask you now a political question, but also it, it borderlines with, with Bible prophecy and that which really intrigues many evangelical Christians around the world. The book of the prophet Ezekiel describes something that many Israelis and Jewish people around the world are well familiar with, and that's the term Gog of the land of Magog. Now, of course, I'm not going to go into all of that, but literally the biblical account speaks of a future invasion into prosperous Israel. And the biblical names given in that chapter are biblical names that I could verify them through Josephus, Flavius, and others as modern-day Russia of today, modern-day Turkey of today, modern-day Iran of today, and then Libya and Sudan as well. And the biblical account is uh, telling us that Israel will be saved because of God's intervention, but there will be no help coming on the way from any other country. However, an interesting protest for the invasion into Israel is going to come not only from the West, 
but actually from Shiba and Didan, which is Saudi Arabia today. And now we're coming to your area of expertise, and that is the ever-changing relationship between Israel and the moderate Sunni Arab world today, as well as the probability of one day a Democrat White House that will no longer see the benefit of even coming and helping Israel. Do you see those things as you look at what's going on in America today and what's going on in the Middle East as well? Well, it's not only the question of uh, an American president who may not appreciate the benefits derived to the U.S. from its ally, uh, Israel. It's a question of uh, the tenant of the White House comprehending the complexities of the Middle East, uh, realizing, for instance, the uh, clear and present and lethal danger to the U.S., to the free world from the Ayatollahs of Iran, potentially, potentially from uh, Erdogan of Turkey, who wants to reestablish the great Ottoman Muslim uh, empire stretching from Central Asia through the Middle East into Europe, into Africa and, uh, and beyond. Uh, the reality uh, is that uh, the Ayatollahs of Iran are not motivated by better standard of living. They certainly are not motivated merely by acquiring control of the Persian Gulf or the Arabian Peninsula or even the Middle East. The Ayatollahs of Iran consider themselves to be the legitimate, uh, divine, divinely ordained leader of the entire world and the chief emissary of the spread of uh, Islam throughout the globe. We have today already uh, Iranian presence in Central Asia, Iranian presence in the uh, continent of Africa, presence in South America, Central America, and growing number of Iranian sleeper cells in the USA. Israel has been in recent years the front line in facing Iran. Israel on the Golan Heights constrains the moves of the Ayatollahs in Syria. Israel on the Golan Heights constrains the moves of Erdogan of Turkey, who has his troops also in Syria and Iraq. And certainly Israel on the Golan Heights constrains the moves of Russia, which is present in uh, Syria. Uh, moreover, when it comes to the pro-American Arab regime, such as Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates and Bahrain and Kuwait and uh, Oman, certainly uh, Jordan and, uh, and Egypt, each one of them has recently expanded uh, its ties with Israel, not because they love peace and not because they accept the so-called infidel sovereignty in what they call the abode of Islam. For a simple reason, they all consider the Jewish state to be the most effective life insurance agent in the Middle East upon which they can trust, upon which they can rely. They had bad experience with President Obama for 10 years uh, when they saw the number one threat to each one of them, the Ayatollahs of Iran, getting tailwind from Washington. They have better experience currently with President uh, Trump, but they fear what will happen in uh, January. One thing they're certain, whether it's left-leaning coalition in Israel or right-leaning coalition in Israel, they can trust the capabilities of the Jewish state. And they do that because Israel is the best defense line, for instance, of the Hashemite regime in Jordan. The Hashemite regime of Jordan knows very well that should there be a Palestinian state 
west of the Jordan River, it would doom the Hashemite regime east of the river. And any alternative to the Hashemite regime in Jordan would be either worse or worse or devilish as far as stability in the region, as far as the interest of the U.S. and Western uh, democracies. Once the Hashemite regime is toppled, there will be ripple effects from Jordan southward into Saudi Arabia and the rest of the Arabian Peninsula mm. pro-American uh, regimes. And therefore, Israel stands on the way of the Ayatollahs to implement their megalomaniac uh, uh, vision to control the entire world. We stand on the way of Erdogan of Turkey to follow a similar megalomaniacal uh, vision of uh, his uh, own. And therefore, once again, it's Israel, which is the most effective beachhead of the U.S. in such a critical region, not only for the Middle East, but for the entire mm. world. Do you agree with me that uh, the Democrats of 20 years ago in America are not the Democrats of today? And their view of Israel then and their view of Israel today is quite different. Well, it's not only the view of Israel. Uh, there is a term in the U.S. Uh, blue dog uh, Democrat, which is contrary to a yellow dog Democrat. A yellow dog Democrat would rather vote for a yellow dog than for a Republican. A blue dog Democrat is a moderate uh, Democrat. In the old days, you couldn't be elected for a nationwide uh, position unless you have the support of the blue dog of the moderate uh, mm -hmm. Democrats. Uh, it may be that those days are gone. Uh, we'll have to wait for November to realize that, but there is no doubt that the radical wing of the Democratic Party is uh, expanding uh, substantially. Uh, and that goes back to the fundamental values which surged the U.S. to global uh, prominence. The current population which votes for a Democratic Party is less connected to the values of the early pilgrims and the founding fathers, such uh, values as patriotism, such values as in God we trust, faith, uh, such values as the values driven by the Ten Commandments, by the Bible as a whole, the Old Testament and the New uh, Testament. Mm -hmm. Increasingly, we see people detached from those uh, values. Detachment from those values departs one from the legacy again of the early pilgrims and the founding fathers. The very wise founding fathers clarified that while there should be a separation between state and church, there must not be separation between religion and society. They understood that to separate society from religion denies society of very, very positive core values which determine personal and communal and national relationship, mm. a coalescing type of, uh, of precepts of society. Today, sadly, we see decline of those uh, values. You can see it, by the way, and you know probably better than I do, uh, attendance of Americans in uh, churches. It's about 30% uh, attendance during Sunday uh, services, which is still dramatically higher in, than Europe, but it's declining. Less and less young Americans attend uh, church. Uh, we see today on the streets in big cities uh, in America, uh, defacing uh, core monuments defacing American history, disregard for American history. You disregard your past. You basically forsake your future because the only responsible way to confront the future, to advance in the future, is by relying on, by studying your uh, past. And the American past and core uh, element 
have has been Judeo Christian values. Mm. Amen to that. Let's move a little bit to the Israeli Palestinian track. Uh, I know that uh, you wrote uh, quite a few things on the benefit of an Israeli imposition of sovereignty on Judea, Samaria, and the Jordan Valley. I'm talking about part of the Trump deal of the century. It seems to me that uh, most uh, Israelis are more or less happy about that uh, deal, whereas the Palestinians categorically are against it. Do you see any benefit for America from an Israeli implementation of sovereignty in the Jordan Valley and the settlements in the West Bank? I'll take you back to October 1994, the signing of the Jordan-Israel Peace Treaty. I heard from uh, uh, top Israeli military commanders that they were approached by their Jordanian colleagues at the ceremony and were told clearly, make sure that no Palestinian state is allowed to be established on the mountains of Judea, Samaria, and the Jordan Valley, because that will doom us in Jordan, east of the Jordan River. Namely, an Israeli control of the mountain ridges of Judea, Samaria, and the Jordan Valley is the first line of defense for the Hashemite regime in Jordan. Obviously, it's critical for Israel's uh, survival as well, because if you uh, deny Israel control of the mountains of Judea, Samaria, you revert Israel back to the narrow sliver between the mountains of Judea, Samaria and the Mediterranean. Mm -hmm. That's an eight to 15 mile sliver in the raging, unpredictable, intolerant, violent, tenuous, frustrating Middle East. Those are suicidal uh, lines. However, controlling the mountain ridges of Judea, Samaria, renders the U.S. major benefits. The mountain ridges of Judea, Samaria, and the Golan Heights are two paramount national security, topographic, geographic elements in the Middle East. Back in 1970, when pro-Soviet Syria invaded pro-U.S. Jordan, U.S. was back down in Cambodia, Vietnam, Laos, could not stretch a hand and help their ally, uh, Jordan. The American president then, Nixon, called Israeli Prime Minister Golda Meir, laid out the reality, and within 48 hours, Israel deployed its forces to the trilateral border of Israel, Syria, and Jordan, which is the Golan Heights. Within 24 hours, the Syrian forces retreated back to Syria without exchanging a single bullet with the Israeli Defense Forces. It was the posture of deterrence of Israel on the Golan Heights, on the mountains of Judea, Samaria, which did the job. You take away Israel from those two highly important topographic, geographic, Golan Heights and Judea and Samaria mountains, and you expose every single pro-American Arab regime to the wrath of the Ayatollahs, to the wrath of ISIS, to the wrath of the Muslim Brotherhood, and you are uh, ahead towards causing an avalanche of anti-American evolution in the uh, Middle East. Israel on top of those mountains serves America's interests, serves the interest of Americans, allies in the Arab world, and obviously serves the interest of Israel. But maybe most importantly, the mountain ridges of Judea and Samaria are in fact the cradle of Jewish history, mm -hmm. the cradle of Judaism, the cradle of Jewish culture, the cradle of Jewish uh, history. And how can any people forsake or retreat from the cradle of its history and still expect to survive in the future? Mm -hmm. Ambassador Ettinger, 
one of the most frustrating things to me as an Israeli, and I consider myself as a conservative Israeli. I don't like to use the terms right or left. I think there are the conservatives, and I think that there are those that call themselves progressives. And once they, by the way, they call themselves progressives, they, as they, they almost claim that we are left behind, that we are somehow thinking old-fashioned way. But you know what? I, I'm not offended by that claim that I think the old-fashioned way, because unfortunately, <laughs> I can say many of the new things that are being offered on the table are disastrous. Now, let's try and, and unlock something that I've been sensing and watching and witnessing from a very young age. I've read the book written by President Harry Truman. It's his memoirs. And uh, the chapter that he gave to the uh, birth of the state of Israel was fascinating to me because I saw almost uh, the same tricks that I see today of intimidation, of painting things in the worst uh, way in order to stop America from taking bold steps when it comes to supporting Israel's existence and Israel's sovereignty here. I'm not even talking about Judea, Samaria, or the Golan Heights. I'm talking about Israel as a nation. You and I know that if it wasn't for President Truman's determination, if it was all up to the State Department of that time with George Marshall as the Secretary of State, the U.S. wouldn't or would not have uh, 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 voted yay for a Jewish state. They did not want that. More than uh, 70 years later, we all witnessed when it comes to President Trump uh, move of the embassy to Jerusalem. Now, this intimidation is not only coming from the liberal State Department, but it also comes, unfortunately, from the Israeli establishment. We see the same thing going on with Israeli Foreign Service and Israeli generals that I think were brainwashed in, in somewhere in America uh, in their studies. And how do you, as someone who served in, obviously you served in the Israeli military, but you also served in the Israeli Foreign Service, how do you settle all that we know about this region and all that we know about the people we're dealing with, our neighbors and all that, with this mindset that still land will give us peace and still let's not make our neighbors angry. Let's not ta take care of our own, lest we make our neighbors angry. How do you see that? Well, this has been the reality of so-called Western conventional wisdom. And by Western, I also include uh, Israel. And the record is very, very clear. As you suggested, in 1948, the State Department, the Pentagon, and the CIA along with the New York Times and Washington Post, they all opposed the establishment of a Jewish state, claiming that the Jewish state was going to be pro-Soviet, anti-American. And why was that? Because the founding fathers of the Jewish state came from East Europe. It never occurred to them that coming from East Europe made them very well aware of the evil of communist uh, system and therefore, they became right away pro-American. They also claimed that the Jewish state would not be able to sustain the coordinated Arab invasion of that newly founded state. And they were overwhelmed when we crashed all the Arab uh, armies around uh, us. They also claimed that there supposedly there was a zero-sum game. Either you're pro-Israel or you're pro uh, Arab, and it never occurred to them that Arabs have many more issues which are much more important than the Israeli uh, mm -hmm. issue. And in fact, when you uh, go fast forward 72 years from 1948, you find out how wrong the establishment was at that uh, time. But it wasn't the only uh, time they were wrong. 78-79, uh, it was an American president, Jimmy Carter, who stabbed the back of America's policemen in the Gulf, America's arch ally, the Shah of Iran. 
And it was the conventional wisdom of Jimmy Carter and the Department of State and basically the defense and the foreign policy establishment in Washington, which assumed that Ayatollah Khomeini in exile those days in Paris only wanted democracy and he wanted peace. And it was the despotic Shah supposedly who denied the Iranian people peace and uh, mm. democracy. And in fact, it was an American president who transformed Iran from the number one ally to the number one uh, enemy, epicenter of international terrorism. You move uh, fast forward to the Iran-Iraq uh, war. Iran-Iraq uh, war planted the misperception that the enemy of my enemy is my friend, namely Saddam Hussein considers Iran to be his enemy, and therefore supposedly Saddam Hussein is a friend of the U.S. And literally until the day of the invasion of Kuwait, back in August of 1990, the U.S. considers Saddam Hussein to be worthy of joint intelligence exchanges and agreements of uh, uh, target to receive dual use sophisticated systems from the U.S. and be a recipient of mega billion uh, dollars worth of loan guarantees. And it was the invasion of Kuwait which crashed this conventional uh, wisdom. Mm. Uh, when the Arab tsunami erupted in December of 2010, right away, it was accorded the very elegant name Arab Spring by the foreign policy establishment in Washington, by President Obama, by the Secretary of State, by the National Security Advisor. And it never occurred to that establishment that the riots and the bloodletting on the streets of Arab capitals in the Middle East was not indeed a faith, Facebook revolution or youth revolution or march of democracy as Obama and Hillary Clinton and John Kerry uh, defined, uh, defined that. And then uh, also uh, came the case of uh, Israel. Israel and signing the Oslo Accord with the Palestinians, with the PLO. The Oslo Accord for any uh, realistic uh, assessment of the Middle East was a major self-destruct uh, agreement. However, it was President Clinton together with Israeli leaders in 1993 who blessed Yasser Arafat of the PLO as a peacemaker, ushered him in to receive the Nobel Prize for Peace, notwithstanding the fact that the Oslo Accord introduced unprecedented wave of hate education and unprecedented wave of Palestinian terrorism into our area. The reason for that gap between Western establishment misperceptions on the one hand and Middle East reality on the other hand is the huge difference between the Middle Eastern culture and the Middle Eastern and the Western uh, culture. In the West, there is a tendency to accord heavy weight to Arab talk. You hear frequently from Western leaders, we visited Arab capitals and we hear everywhere Palestinian issue, Palestinian issue, Palestinian issue. But that's the talk. Do you examine also the Arab walk, which is exactly 180 from that talk? And obviously, it's much easier to rely on talk rather than spend time and thoughts and assessments on an analyzing the Arab uh, walk. When it comes to Arab walk, no Arab country wants a Palestinian state. No Arab country has ever shed a drop of blood for Palestinians. Arab countries have given petty type of contributions, financial contributions to the Palestinian cause. And there is a reason for that. The reason is that the Arabs perceive Palestinians to be the role model of inter-Arab treachery. 
and inter-Arab terrorism and subversion. In 1955, Arafat and Mahmoud Abbas, the leaders of the Palestinians, had to run away from Egypt for subversion and terrorism. They were involved with the Muslim Brotherhood in uh, Egypt. Mm. Syria opened its doors, but by 1966, the Palestinians could not control themselves, and they launched a wave of terrorism inside Syria. They had to run away from Syria to to Jordan. Jordan. Jordan allowed them to operate terrorism against Israel for two years. But by 1970, they felt strong enough to try and topple the Hashemite regime in Jordan, which yielded a civil war in Jordan, and they had to run away to Lebanon. For five years, 1970, 1975, they plundered southern Lebanon. They felt strong enough to challenge the center regime in Beirut, which caused a series of civil wars inside Lebanon. And then came 1990, Saddam Hussein's invasion of Kuwait. Kuwait, by that time, was the most generous Arab country towards the Palestinians. They absorbed 400,000 Palestinians, second only to Jordan, as far as Palestinian Mm. population in an Arab uh, country. They allowed them to ascend to top administrative financial business positions. They levied 5% excise tax on any Palestinian earning and transferred it to the stashed accounts of Arafat and Mahmoud Abbas throughout the world. But it was that most generous Arab host, which was stabbed in its back by the Palestinians who collaborated with Saddam's invasion of uh, of Kuwait, which was the reason for Sheikh Sabah of Kuwait, upon reasserting himself, complement of American blood and American finances, the first thing he did was expelling almost all Palestinians from Kuwait. And the question which I always pose to Americans and Israelis who adhere to this universalism type of state of mind, why don't you study the Arab conduct towards Palestinians Why do you rely so much on the Arab talk rather than examine the Arab uh, walk? In the Middle East, there is a saying, on words, one does not pay custom. Why not use it? Moreover, in the Middle East, which is conducted mostly in accordance with the fundamentals of Islam, there is even a commandment to use misleading a dissimulation type of language, takia, takia, in order to mislead and overcome the so-called infidel. That type of rhetoric does not obligate you as a Muslim. It's a tactic in the war against the infidel. And we can ask ourselves, how many times have we heard the term peace uttered by Arabs? And how many times have they violated it? not mostly vis-a-vis Israel, but mostly in their own internal Arab wars. And I think we would benefit greatly if we would study the Arab conduct towards themselves and towards Palestinians rather than rely on Arab rhetoric as our own pillar of uh, fire. This has been one of the most fascinating and interesting interview that I had here because, you know, you you give so much wisdom that comes from personal experience, not just uh, a study guide from somewhere. I would like to conclude this interview with your opinion on the future of the Israeli-American relationship as we approach the November elections in the United States And as we watch what is going on in the streets of some of the major cities in America today and the growing anti-Semitism that is accompanying uh, Black Lives Matter's agenda, Antifa's agenda, the embrace of these organizations of the Palestinian 
a narrative on one hand, and of course, on the other hand, to see a representative such as Ilhan Omar and Rashida Talib that are uh, are not even hiding their anti-Israeli policies. How do you see the future of the Israeli-American relationship in light of all that I just described? The future of the bilateral relations must uh, be a derivative of past uh, relations, uh, learning how to avoid mistakes and uh, learning how to improve ourselves. When we watch past performance, uh, there is an obvious conclusion. There is a unique synergy between the American and the Israeli societies. And that unique synergy is a derivative of the fundamentals of both societies going back again to Judeo-Christian values. One needs, in my mind, to revive those values, to strengthen those uh, values, both in the U.S. as well as in uh, Israel. Uh, We have here two societies that are based on faith. There are certain differences in faith, but there's no difference in the realization of the centrality of uh, faith, in the centrality of the belief in uh, God. In fact, uh, the reality of the American uh, federal uh, system is a derivative of uh, the uh, Old Testament, which has taught us that there is only one king, Mm -hmm. uh, God, and no human being should be a king over other human uh, being. The early pilgrims, the founding fathers, took it from uh, uh, the judge Gideon and from the prophet uh, Samuel. Uh, We need to make sure that the defiance of odds Uh, which has characterized the American society and the Israeli societies, uh, remain as uh, such. And again, defiance of odds is a a lesson which we learn from old ancient Jewish uh, history. The 40 years in the desert was uh, one major defiance of uh, odds, again, guided by faith, guided by the belief in, uh, in God. At the same time, at the same time, we should also pay attention of Americans mostly, but also Israelis, as far as the very tangible uh, benefits. Uh, we are today collaborating medically to find different uh, medications, different uh, vaccination systems against the corona uh, virus and against future uh, pandemics. And again, American and Israeli biotech companies have worked together for many, many years, uh, yielding much benefits to both uh, sides. There is a reason why some 250 American high-tech giants operate research and development centers in Israel, leveraging the brain power. And the reason has to do with the synergy between the American brain power and the Israeli brain uh, power. And I would venture to say more, more than any other synergy, whether it's American, British, or American, French, or American, German, the American-Israeli synergy works better commercially works better, militarily works better because of the foundations of both uh, societies. I would like to see Israel paying more attention to small town America. Small town America has unique political power inside uh, America and small town America has an abundance of pro-Israel, pro-Judeo-Christian sentiments. But again, sadly, most Israeli mover and shakers are acquainted with New York and Los Angeles and Chicago, maybe even Houston and Dallas and uh, Atlanta and Miami, but not with small town America, not with Nakadoshi's uh, uh, Texas and not with uh, Boaz 
or Dothan, uh, Alabama, but that's where, in my mind, the core power of America exists, and certainly the core engine behind the special America-Israel ties. Mm -hmm. Ambassador Ettinger, if people want to stay in touch with what you write and uh, what you say, uh, can you tell our viewers how to follow you on social media or forums that you are writing for? Well, I, I publish weekly uh, articles in English and in Hebrew. Uh, they're posted on my website, uh, www.theettingerreport.com. I also post my articles on Facebook and Twitter and uh, LinkedIn. Uh, I produced a number of uh, short uh, videos on the 400th anniversary of uh, U.S.-Israel uh, kinship on various aspects of the Middle East. And uh, I would welcome uh, any feedback even straight directly to my own uh, email, which is uh, one word, yoramtex at gmail.com. Well, thank you very much for being our guest on this interview. And I'm looking forward to the next time we're going to meet together and talk on current issues and glean from your wonderful wisdom. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.